Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. We're going to preach on when your honey starts acting funny. 2 Samuel chapter 6, 14 through 17, also chapter 20, verse 23. Then David danced before the Lord with all of his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord, was shouting with the sound of the trumpet. Now the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. David then returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, Oh, how glorious was the king of... Can you hear that tone? How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father. Oh, don't talk about a girl's dad like that. Oh, Lord. And all of his house to appoint me ruler over the people of Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will even be more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maid servants of whom you've spoken, by them will I be held in honor. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children unto the day of his death. I'm going to tell you how to cause marital problems every time. There's three ways you can cause marital problems every time. Number one is family strife, meaning getting into arguments with your in-laws. Number two, if you want family strife, get into religious division. I'm this religion. You're that religion. I'm not going to be your religion. I'm not going to serve your God. You're saved. I'm not saved. Uh, so get into a battle over your religion, and you're going to have difficulty in your marriage. And the third way to have marital strife is being accused of, of getting attention from another woman or your wife getting attention from another man. Go ahead, I'm going to preach anyhow. I told you we're going to preach this message today. Now, the thing that had happened to David is David got hit with them all three in 24 hours. Okay? So watch this. Strike number one, family strife. He looks at a girl and says, I'm better than your daddy. God didn't even like your daddy. And God raised me up instead of your daddy. Ooh! If that girl likes her daddy, don't you be talking about her daddy like that. That's like somebody talking about your mama. Come on now. Nobody talks about mama. You slap somebody sideways talking about your mama. So now, boy, you know, she's, got, she's on edge. You going to talk about my daddy like that? And then he says the second thing. Let's talk about religion for a moment. You little dry, unsanctified woman, you're up here in a window looking down when you should be down there praising yourself. So here's how it is. If you thought I'd dance now, you ain't seen nothing yet. So now they're in a battle over worship. They're in a battle over religion. But this is the one that really did it. Look at this. So she's saying to him, oh, you could put on that ephod. Now, you know, there was a long ephod, and then there was one that was a little shorter. I'll get, let you guess which one David probably had on. And he's up there just shaking and shimming, and the women are laughing. Oh, look at David. Oh, look at David. And she saw it. She became a little bit jealous. And she said, you got out there just to show off in front of all of those young girls. That's what you were doing. And he says to her, basically, you know what? You might be my wife, and you don't honor me, but there'll be some women who will. You, you, did you just read what I said? That's basically what he says. I will be held high in honor among those women, and maybe not among you. Well, can I tell you what that'll do? Shut the bedroom door. Help me preach some, somebody. I mean, look, strike number one, you talked about my daddy wrong. Strike number two, you're, you're countering what I'm saying about what I believe in worship. And count number three, you're talking about those other women. I'm sorry, we're done. And here's the reason I know she shut the bedroom door. Everybody ready? Where was she when Bathsheba showed up? Because after all, they were in the king's palace. And the king's palace is where the bedroom was. Where I'm going to get blunt. I told you, this ain't for just weak Christians. The palace is where the bedroom was. And he brings Bathsheba into the bedroom. And how come she's not there? Because mama, somebody else is in the bedroom beside mama. 
Now, we do not know. We do not know. People have said for years that God cursed her to where she couldn't have children. That's not in the Bible. It may possibly be that she just completely cut him off from the bed, cut him off from any kind of physical relationships. And I just want to tell all you women something sitting out there and anybody watching. When you start manipulating with sex with your husband and start cutting him off, look out, Jesse will show up. Oh, that's, oh. And it, hey, it works both ways. And I'm, I'm going to talk about some things today. So my point is simply this, that, you know, Bathsheba's husband is out fighting the battle. He's never around. And when he does come home, he don't even go home and say hi to his wife. And then David has a wife that won't, she's just as cold as a refrigerator, and she's not hanging around him at all. So when you've got, a, when you've got the wife that's cold as the refrigerator, and you've got the husband over here on the opposite end that don't any, concerned about anything his wife's doing, you got an affair getting ready to happen. Y'all looking at me like I don't know what I'm preaching here, but I'm telling you from the Word what can happen. Are you still here? Some of you act like you get nervous in the service. You, ain't, oh, you haven't got nervous yet. I haven't started really getting into this message like you think I'm going to get into this message. <laughs> now, here's the thing. The rift that David encountered was opened to him because of the need for attention and affection which he was not getting from his wife. In this case, honeys can act funny. I'm going to tell now what honey, honey is not honey from a bee in case you're just not understanding what my message is about. Honey is that expression meaning uh, it's a, an expression of affection, of endurement. Sometimes us southern guys, how many know southern guys, uh, sweetheart, darling, and honey, and if you're a real southern gentleman, it kind of comes out all the time, and you don't mean, mean it sometimes, but it just slips. Do I have any southern gentlemen here? I don't even know if I'm preaching in the south right now. I'm just trying to figure this out. But you, you do understand. And if, if you've ever noticed in, in the South, and this surprises some people from the Midwest, Northeast, etc., but they come to Tennessee, for example, and the waitress is waiting on you, and she leans over and said, Hey, sugar, you need some sweet tea? <laughs> and that wife said, Did she just call you sugar? <laughs> right? Oh, they'll say, Darling, can you want, darling, you want some cornbread, sweetheart? You, but you got to understand, she's not coming on to your husband. That's just the culture down here in the deep, deep south. Are you all glad that we're friendly people around here? I'm glad we're friendly people, okay? All right. <laughs> Let me get off that subject for a minute. Here's what's happening even in the body of Christ. People are separating after the kids have fully grown because the husband or the wife says, you know, I didn't really have a life. I got married so early, had to raise all these kids, so I'm going to go find myself. We've had people, we get letters from individuals who are being divorced after 25 to 45 years of marriage. We have uh, people that contact us and said, I want you to pray because I feel like my companion is losing interest in me after being married for 20 and 30 years. And there's a lot of people, there's a spirit of independence out there right now that a lot a lot of people just want to get away from it. They see marriage as a bondage, and they want to separate and get away to go seek their own independence. I'm telling you, all this stuff is beginning to happen. So I tried to uh, discover what could be the roots, maybe the four roots of what's causing these four things to happen. I think I, think I found basically the four. Number one is social media. Uh, you need to understand something. Don't be contacting your old boyfriend before you got married. Now, sometimes you'll meet them, sometimes you'll accidentally come across them, but don't be starting up conversations, staying up at late Facebook, and I'm going to preach this anyhow, because that person, you did not marry them. They are not related in relationship with you, and what happens is you'll start stirring up all these old memories, oh, didn't we have fun, wasn't that great, and next thing you know, and it has happened to people, they're out secretly meeting that person somewhere in another state. So social media has caused the problem. Number two, and this, you think this is only men, but Robbie and I were talking one day, and there was a new statistic that came out, are you ready, that there are as many women into pornography now as there are men. I know that sounds totally hard to believe, but that it's become that way. When people begin to get into pornography, you get into a fantasy world that really does not exist. And then you start comparing the images you see to that which you are married to. And next thing you know, people have fantasized and got themselves into a bondage of pornography. So pornography is one of the things. Now, a doctor explained it this way. He said the reason pornography is dangerous is because
because you know that that woman is not your wife or that man you're looking at is not your husband, but the way the brain is chemically wired, now listen to this, it releases those chemicals and your, your brain cannot tell if it is your companion or not. Now it knows that, but he said based on the release of the chemicals, the brain chemicals are the same and it can't tell the difference as far as the chemical release. Number three, I preached a message years ago and I'll just bring it up now. The reason there is separations, divorces taking place often, it's called Board of the Rings. <laughs> Not Lord of the Rings, B-O-R-E-D, Board of the Rings, meaning the routine is the same over and over and again. Nothing is interesting in life. You've got to find something to spark you. You've got to find something to recreate interest in you, and thus the problems begin. Number four is simply called marriage burnout. Being overworked, feeling unappreciated, coming to a midlife crisis, and then you, again, the escapism come, comes, and then people begin to do rather foolish things or crazy things or unwise things. How many of you know couples have to remain in love? And can I tell you something? Most of us think love is just a feeling, and the feeling comes, and then the feeling goes. I had the feeling I was in love. The feeling is gone, so I'm out of love. That is not true. Let me tell you, it's like forgiving somebody. Forgiving somebody is not what you feel like you should do. It's what you know you have to do. And being in love is like that. Forgiving is a choice. Being in love becomes a choice. When things are going great, oh, it's wonderful. When things are messing up and going bad, you're ready to bail out perhaps. But you have to make a choice that you got connected to that person a long time ago for some reason. And whatever it was that attracted you to them when you were younger, you've got to refocus on what that is. Now, all, if all you did was marry her because she was pretty and she can't cook and she's a a little bit on the dumb side, come on, and she don't know how to raise kids, can I tell you something, when the beauty is gone, you'll probably walk out the door. Hell, I'm preaching now to somebody, and that's not the right thing to do, and that's the wrong thing to do, because, sir, in case you haven't looked at yourself, you don't quite look like you used to look like. <laughs> Woo, Jesus help us. So number four, let me, I better get back to this. Number four is this. At times, people feel unappreciated, and so it causes contention or it causes strife. You have to remain in love. Now, for the next few moments, and this may be addressed not only to young couples, couples that are about to be married, but it also can be addressed to us. I want to do something. I'm going to go to a teaching that I did to our, for our young people called Don't Awaken Love Before the Time. And a lot of the adults maybe have never heard this. A little bit of this I've used before, if you've heard it before. Bear with me. If you've never heard it, it has some great explanations to it. Now, for a moment, and I'll get back to this perhaps a little bit later on, what makes a person feel in love? And the answer is attraction. Because if you were never attracted to the person you're married, you would have never had the feeling that you were in love with them. Something pulled you toward the person. In your, when you're younger, for a guy, it might be looks. For a girl, it might be the romance. For the guy, it may be the fact that she's, somebody said guys marry women that's like their mama. And I know that sounds totally ridiculous, but my wife Pam cooks just like my mama did. My mama cooked for us kids, took care of the house, and she's a lot like that. And I didn't just marry Pam because she could cook and take care of a house. And she could do it from the time she was a teenager. I married her because she was hot. Jonathan, I don't know if you got a picture of your mama back there when she was young. Now, I, look, I think she still is, okay? You know, I said that one time when I was preaching. She said, so what do you think of me now? <laughs> I said, baby, I'm not saying you're not now. <laughs> That's like one time. What was that you said to Tammy? And I laughed. She, she, you said, man, I married a beautiful woman. And Tammy said, well, what about me now? <laughs> so... <laughs> Pam and Tammy are cut out of the same frame from Alabama, I think. So the point I make is attraction. 
Now, what causes attraction? Have you ever wondered about that? What, what makes you, for example, be attracted to certain people to become your friend? What makes you attracted when you were dating? All right, let's go through this. They have discovered something that it, the Bible knew all along. Jesus keeps talking about the heart, the heart, the heart. And he said, out of the heart proceeds. He talks about lying proceeds from their adultery, proceeds from their murder, proceeds from their... But it never made sense to me, so I always translated that to say, he must be talking about the mind because the heart can't think, the heart parts blood. But G Jesus knew all along what he was talking about. I mean, you'll believe Jesus believes Jesus knows what he's talking about, okay? So they found out in scientific research that the heart, the heart right here, has a brain of its own. And this is totally fa fascinating. Now, have you ever wondered how someone maybe in the gay lifestyle can go into a place and automatically sense somebody that has the same lifestyle and there's no outward evidence that they do? Have you ever noticed, and if you've ever been uh, connected to church a lot, that there are couples that sometimes are attracted to each other and you will find out later that this woman fell into an adulterous sin and that guy years ago fell into one and all of a sudden they do nothing about their their sins of the past, and all of a sudden they're hooking up. And someone said, how did that happen? And then you can go that, you can take that into all sorts of things. Well, here's what they've discovered. They've discovered that the heart has a brain of its own, and it has a nervous system within it that works like an antenna that actually releases energy. It responds, now this is crazy, it responds to the elect electromagnetic field that others are producing. How many of you have ever noticed that when you get really afraid, you feel it in your belly. Raise your hand. Do you have, you do, how many of you know when you're really joyful? All of your emotions, whether good or bad, you seem to feel it in what we call the pit of the stomach. You ever heard anybody say, boy, I had a gut feeling that was going to happen, right? Now, there is something called the gut nerve. How many of you have never heard of the gut nerve? Raise your hand if you've never heard of the gut nerve. All right. Brian can do a whole lot better than this. The gut nerve is called the second brain. The gut nerve that comes from the stomach up into the brain has 100 million neurons more than the spinal cord or your main nervous system. Here's a quote. A big part of your emotions are influenced by the emotions in your gut. So, if you've always wanted to know why, and I always have, how come when I got afraid, I felt a churning here? How come when I got angry, I felt the, the, the neck, you know, kind of negative in my belly? Well, Jesus said the Holy Spirit dwells where? In, your, in, the, in the innermost being. The Spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord, Proverbs said, searching all the inward parts of the belly. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So God knew a couple things. He knew that your heart heart, that out of the heart it has kind of a process of its own, and out of it comes the negative things of life. He also knew that there is an electromagnetic field. The whole body is electric. If you don't believe it, hook somebody up to a heart monitor and watch. Watch how they hook up your brain waves. Come on, when my granddad was in the hospital, they had his brain hooked up, said he had three strokes to the brain, and you could watch that little cocoon your mama. Your whole body is electromagnetic, so this is not a weird teaching because everything. Why is is it when you have a heart attack, they put electrical shocks on you? Why do you have a pacemaker in your heart? Because it put electrical impulses in you. Everything about you has electrical currents in it. All right? Now, the heart has that ability. Then the brain, using words and different, whether they be positive words or negative words, produces uh, chemicals that are released in the body. Number three, the gut nerve that runs from the stomach area all the way up to the brain is a great part of everything connecting about what we're about to talk about. Now say this with me. My emotions, my emotions. Correspond, correspond to my thinking. To my thinking. True story. When you think happy thoughts, I can't help it. Every time I say that, I got, a, I got a sidetrack here. Jonathan and I, when we were preaching in the, uh, the Carolinas, this is a long time ago. He was just a little boy. He, he would lay over here. I would say, this is your arm right here, buddy. This is your arm. They got the movie Hook that came out. Did anybody's grandkids or kids have to watch Hook? Captain Hook. Come on, raise your hands. Y'all can't be that old. Now, come on, help me here. Uh, Captain Hook. And, and Captain Hook comes back, you know, to London and captures uh, Peter Pan's kids. And he's got to go back. But Peter has forgotten how to fly. He became 
a lawyer, and he got caught up, in it. so he goes back to Never Never Land, and he gets there, and what does Tinkerbell say to him? You've got to learn to fly. And she says, think happy thoughts. Think happy thoughts. And unless he thinks happy thoughts, he can't fly. Some of you act like you don't even know where I got off on that on. I don't either, but I'm just trying to make a point, okay? So, <laughs> so. It is a fact that if we begin to think happy things, endorphins are released in our body. Endorphins can come through chocolate. Endorphins can come through certain food. Endorphins can come through the fact that you just found out that you won a prize for $5,000. Woo! Something happens. Found out that you're going to Hawaii for your, for your honeymoon. Hey, come on, somebody help me. I might be prophesying. Might be prophesying to somebody out there. Woo! You found out you're going to get a brand new car for nothing. Oh! Ooh, come on, is anybody getting happy? Oh, somebody's going to give you a house. Hey, somebody going to die and leave you a house. Ooh, is anybody getting happy? Okay. Endorphins are released. Oh, you're going you to have a great day. Every, you're having a bad day. Now your day has changed, and now you feel good. Why do you feel good? Not because, just because you got good information. You got uh, endorphins that are released. So good relations, exercising, eating chocolate. Yes, that's right. Believe it or not, releases endorphins. Now, here's the thing I want to tell you that's very important. If you are a negative person, uh, my wife, and I don't want to, I don't want to say too much, but my wife has encountered people in her life that literally, literally nothing positive you say do they receive. You can say, isn't it a beautiful day? Yeah, but they're expecting rain. <laughs> that is a beautiful car. Yeah, but the other day they put it in and it come back here and let me show it to you, okay? Oh, what a beautiful dog. Why, somebody left me that dog. It's nothing. It just gets in the way all the time. And there are some people that are absolutely negative that I, can I say this? I believe that there are a few people I've met in my life, I can count probably on one hand, maybe, maybe even a few fingers. I can count a few, few people that I think have talked themselves so negative that they're in a rut and a grave and can't get their self out. Amen. Can I say something else about some people? Some people use their problems to get attention. If they didn't have a problem, there's not much to say to them. So they'll go on Facebook, talk about how bad it is, so you'll come on and say, oh, honey, we're praying for you. And every day is a bad day to get you to respond to them of how you're showing them attention. Preach. I'm very happy to give you the opportunity to obtain the CDs and the DVDs of the main event Fall Revival Camp Meeting, the greatest meeting we have had in the history of the ministry as far as the power of God and the anointing happened during this meeting. You're going to hear eight messages on the CDs and DVDs. They include my message, The Coming Jezebel Spirit and the Elijah Showdown, the message I preached on releasing the final Jubilee Revival, the patterns of 2017, the message I preached on pursuing the first fruit family blessing. Also, I preached on sacred scars wounded in the house of my friends and a message called when your honey starts acting funny. You need to hear this. Also, we had Kevin Wallace preaching. He's the God of the Valley. Tommy Bates preached. Look up. Your blessing is in the field. Ron Carpenter preached the power of the sound. Eight CDs and DVDs. Now, on the CD, it's the message only. On the DVDs, you see the powerful move of God, the anointing, and the message also as well. Now, if you want the CDs, they're for a donation of $50 or more. Ask for offer 16-MECD. The eight DVDs are $90 or more donation, uh, 16 ME DVD. The information is there on the screen. You can order by calling 1-888-21-BREAD, 1-888-21-BREAD, or go to perrystone.org and order online. Or you can write me at Perry Stone P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. And be sure and put the offer number, whether it's CD or DVD, and the amount uh, requested for the information and for the resource material. And we do hope that you'll take advantage of this at this time. There are several of these messages that when you see me preach them on TV, they are edited. This is unedited. All of it's unedited. You get the unedited version. And the second thing is on television, I'm usually showing you the first 21, 22 minutes of the beginning of the message. And most of the time, the main meat is in the middle all the way to the end. So that's why we suggest get the CDs and the DVDs of the main event while they're available. And remember, your support of getting this material helps keep manifest on the air in your area. So we hope to hear from you today. God bless you. 
Well, this is the last of our series of the main event. I hope you'll get the DVDs or the CDs. I got to tell you something about this message. When your honey starts acting funny, people told me, Perry, they said, if you weren't called to preach, you should be a comedian because pro I promise you, it was the funniest message maybe I've ever preached in my entire life. I, someone said, if your daddy would have been a living, uh, been living uh, and heard you preach that, he would have just been on the floor laughing and, and, and red faced. But anyway, uh, I want you to hear this because it deals, what we deal with is how that, um, how the enemy tries to attack marriages and, and what to do about it. And it's just a good message to hear, okay? And I hope you get, I hope you hear the unedited version and all of it. So, uh, so much for that. But anyway, um, we want to, want to share with you that, uh, you know, as far as our ministry is concerned, we take off the month of December and January. Uh, we're planning on going up to a, a, a church in West Virginia in January to minister to a group of young people up there, um, which uh, January in West Virginia, the weather can be really rough. And I know that, but you know, we're planning on doing that. But um, one of the things that we're going to do, and I want you to pray about this. I'm sharing this with you to pray about. You know, we do a lot of things with young people. Now, our two Warrior Fest, March and April, are coming up back to back next year. But we, we do something that we're going to call Release the Roar. And we're hoping in the summer months to go to uh, several different locations with our Release the Roar conference where churches really come together and we have a big, big youth event. And um, the reason I'm doing this is because I, I, there's, there's a, such a hunger in this generation. And at the same time, the enemy is attacking our young people with drugs and uh, with so many other things. We have, you know, 60% of our young people, some, in some places it's 70%, they don't have a dad in their life, they don't have a mother in their life, or they're being raised by a precious single, single parent who's trying to work two jobs to make it. Uh, they're under a lot of peer pressure. And so I want you to pray with me that God will give us clear clarity and direction. Uh, we will be coming back, of, of course, up into the Appalachian region again to some meetings there. We just feel like that's our, where, where God wants to break out and where He wants to move. And so um, I'm, I'm asking you uh, as we come into the winter months to be, be much in prayer with us. Now, just as a added note, in the month of January, at some point, I will be releasing on Manifest the uh, New Testament Bible and Commentary. They're printing it right now, uh, 300,000 uh, page commentary of the New Testament, and we're printing up 75,000 copies. So when we announce it on Manifest, uh, which again will be probably the month of January, it's very important that you, you respond quickly to that uh, to get your copy while we have that. We have 15,000 partners editions that are only going to partners where they'll be able to purchase those. And uh, my, my goal is not to print any more than those 15,000. Uh, that's the plan. But uh, it took us um, somewhere, we did, the, we did the whole Bible. What was so funny is we couldn't put uh, the commentary in a Bible. It would have been this thick. The Old Testament commentary is 700,000 words, and the whole Bible is like, I don't know the exact number, what, 780,000 words in the King James translation. So uh, just for your information, uh, just be looking for that in January. We're excited about it. We're excited about the ISO School of the Word. We're excited about what God's doing at OCI. And so um, this, this time, uh, we take time off to study, to pray, to write books, to write material and different things to prepare for the year. Uh, so we ask you to continue to pray for us as, as we pray for you and pray for, for our country that God will give it the clarity and the direction with the, with the new leadership that's there that it needs. Uh, you, you know, we're the divided states of America and we're going to stay that way till the Lord ret returns. There's nothing that can bring us together because it's just two opposing sides. But let's pray for unity and peace, at least in the body of Christ, because we are a family. Amen. Okay, I'll be back next week with some new programs.